Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. Since it's Christmas, I thought I'd do things a little different and less depressing, so today's episode will take a look at Vintage Airways. Established in 1992, with the inaugural flight taking place in December 1993, Vintage Airways would operate two piston-powered Douglas DC-3 aircraft on sightseeing flights from Orlando. These flights were, however, no ordinary sightseeing flights. Upon boarding, passengers would step back in time to the mid-1940s, May 8th, 1945 in fact. The aircraft cabin was fitted with 30 comfortable seats. The Andrews sisters would be playing out over the aircraft's public address system. The flight attendant welcoming those on board would be wearing 1940s garb, complete with white gloves and fitted hats. The pilots too were wearing typical 1940s airman uniforms. They even did the pre-flight inspection with the airline's mascot, a chocolate Labrador called Skippy. As the aircraft would make its way towards the runway, the flight attendant would perform a safety briefing and then would announce some recent news headlines including the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Vice President Harry Truman's inauguration and the 37th birthday of Betty Davis and her eyes. Once in the air, the DC-3 would typically cruise between 4 and 8,000 feet. In an extra attempt at giving the passengers a good view, the DC-3s had been modified with a larger photo window. Simply put, a bit of fuselage was cut out between two existing windows to form one larger one. As the aircraft was unpressurised, this wouldn't present any issues such as those that befell the de Havilland Comet. In fact, the only problem with the large window was that it had been placed over the aircraft's fairly sizeable wing. Vintage Airways didn't have its own in-flight magazines, but instead offered its passengers a selection of period magazines, Life, The Saturday Evening Post, or Look magazine. There was no plastic on board either. Drinks such as mimosas and rum punch were served in crystal glasses, with snacks such as candied almonds being served from paper packets. News would soon come through to the flight that there had been victory in Europe and that the war was finally drawing to a close. The flight attendants would enthusiastically celebrate with the willing passengers and pop open some champagne. Passengers would each be given the opportunity to head forward into the cockpit, take a seat behind the pilot and don a headset for a chat with the flight crew, something that of course is no longer possible these days. Eventually the flight would land at Key West with the passengers stepping down the aircraft steps and onto the tarmac. They would have an option of taking a guided tour of the old town or leaving the shuttle in town to do their own thing. They'd be picked up later in the evening ahead of the return flight. So you might be thinking, buy yet that livery and logo look familiar, and you'd be right. There certainly was a connection with the Virgin Group. Vintage Airways was a division of Pelican Express, a Florida-based cargo carrier and associated flight school. It was a co-idea of Pelican's owner, Terry Fenson, and Richard Branson who then created Vintage Air Tours, a tour operator which would organise these day trips and charter the Vintage Airways flights. The livery was red and white and to be honest could easily pass for a 1940s Virgin Atlantic livery had they been around at the time. The company logo was again heavily inspired by Virgin, right down to the font and signature V. The two aircraft were registered November 1-2 Romeo Bravo and November 2-2 Romeo Bravo. No points for guessing what the Romeo Bravo stood for. Both carried names. 12 was named Amelia after Amelia Earhart and 22 was named Eve after Branson's mother, a former 1940s flight attendant who flew for British South American Airways. The story of BSSA and the mysterious disappearance of three of their aircraft is for another day however. As a side note, apparently Eve was scheduled to have worked one of the doomed flights but was replaced days beforehand. Anyway, back to Vintage Airways. Both DC-3s had seen wartime service. 22 was delivered to the US Army Air Force in April 1942 before being sold as surplus in 1945. 12 would see wartime service in 1944, with the aircraft being based in the South Pacific and entering civilian life in Australia before being brought back to the US. Prior to entering service, both aircraft had been refurbished which would see the inclusion of a public address and audio system, soundproofing to help reduce engine noise, air conditioning and the previously mentioned photo window. Vintage Airways would operate four flights a week from Orlando's Kissimmee Gateway Airport to Key West via Fort Lauderdale, as well as four scenic flights to the Kennedy Space Center. The company had originally been operating from Orlando Executive, but relocated in part due to agreeing lower fees, but also to consolidate operations with another venture, Virgin Lightships, an advertising blimp and airship operator. It would be the Virgin connection that was the undoing of Vintage Airways. 
By the end of 1994, the US Department of Transportation was investigating the company's foreign ownership links. According to a DOT spokesman, the department had received an informal complaint regarding vintage air tours alleging violations of the citizenship rule. The citizenship rule forbids more than 25% of the stock of US air carriers to be held by a foreign individual or company. Also, US carriers must be controlled by US citizens regardless of the stock. The investigation centred on whether the Vintage Airways operation is clearly owned and controlled by a US business interest. It seemed that the line between Vintage Air Tours and Vintage Airways was a little too blurry for some. Vintage Air Tours insisted that they were a tour agency and not an airline. This was backed up by Pelican Express, the operator of Vintage Airways and owner of the DC-3 aircraft. The citizenship rule didn't apply to air charters. However, the DOT were concerned about how the various companies came together for the Vintage operation as a whole. Both Vintage and Virgin soon fired off accusations of their own, insisting that the investigation was due to complaints from numerous disgruntled former employees, for, at the time, Virgin had undergone a management shake-up of its Florida-based companies, resulting in several job losses, including that of Paul Wassner Jr., the former president and vice president of five of these companies, including Vintage. He accused the company of being a house of cards, adding that there were problems on every level. Kip Roddenberry, the former marketing director of Vintage Air Tours, said that the company had financial problems since day one and was constantly struggling to pay its bills on time. Roddenberry said he left in part due to the financial problems of the small company and the turmoil caused by the terminations or forced resignations of Wozner and other management employees of a related company alleging that at least seven people left or were forced to leave. They included the manager of Virgin Territories Inc. and the company's accountant. Virgin Territories was a sister company to Virgin Atlantic and was a tour operator based in Florida which arranged attraction tickets for arriving Virgin Atlantic passengers. The company threatened several key individuals with legal action over missing money, though these were rebuffed as attempts at discrediting individuals who may have known about rules being bent or broken. Though, as far as I can tell, no legal action was ever taken against anyone. Vintage Airways suspended operations in late 1994 due to the restructuring and subsequent fallout. During the investigation from the Department of Transportation, the Federal Aviation Administration had said that Vintage Airways was considered to be operating safely by Pelican Express. They also added that it was operating within federal guidelines in terms of maintenance, training and licensing, so it seemed it wasn't quite over just yet. With a deal in place with South Florida Sea Ventures and Naples Air Tours, Vintage Airways was back in business come February 1995. The premise was still the same, but flights would instead operate from Naples, Naples, Florida, not Italy. A further deal was struck for a summer wet lease to Transnorth Aviation of Wisconsin. They would take a DC-3 and operate it on flights from Pewaukee Municipal Airport to Eagle River, once again taking passengers on a trip back in time. By the end of 1995, Vintage Airways had ceased operations permanently, bringing the story of this little aviation oddity to a close. But what happened next, you may ask? Well, both DC 3s sat idle for several years. November 22 Romeo Bravo, Eve, was destroyed in 2004 when Hurricane Charlie flipped her onto her back and crashed her into an aircraft hangar. November 1 2 Romeo Bravo, Amelia, however, fared much better. She's now with the Covenor Flight Museum and still flies today. 76 years after entering service. Thanks for watching. I tried to do something different for today's episode. Call it a bit of a Christmas special, if you will. I hope you enjoyed it. I have plenty more episodes in the works, but I'm always open to suggestions and comments. If you really like the series, then consider subscribing. That way, you can catch each episode as soon as it lands. And as always, thanks for watching.